Hey guys, it is 2.2 step three literary aspect jigsaw. And this is the video for the literary aspect that we're calling use of unnaming. And so it's both the use of naming and the use of taking away a name. All right. How is this literary aspect defined is the first question in your notes. Well, first of all, it's any reference to naming or labeling or changing names or taking away names. Of course, any noun is a kind of name, right? In that it is a label for something. Um, so it, that could work. I think um, even more importantly, a proper noun naming of a person um, is what we want to focus on. But really any reference to naming or labeling or taking those away. Um, one aspect, of course, that's important in the book is uh, the fact that handmaids are given new names and their names are a creation of their commander's name with the prefix uh, um, of, right? So Offred's name is of Fred, Avglin's name is of Glenn, of Warren, of Warren, that one sounds the same. And I forgot to change this one, so sorry about that. But it um, it is kind of an interesting uh, new name, isn't it? It shows that the handmaids are property um, of the commander. And so watch for other aspects like that in the book as you're reading. Um, notice that Alfred is preoccupied with language. She is focused on words from the beginning of the book and then throughout. Um, she's thinking about the naming of things, what things used to be called, what they're called now. Sometimes she's pleased when she remembers an old name, a, a name from the time before. Um, and she'll spend some time sometimes like theorizing why other words or names have changed. Um, and so that's worth watching as you read. Um, something else you can look for are these neologisms or newly created terms, newly coined terms. Um, neologis, uh, neologisms um, are what the regime creates um, and names people or things in order to um, further their own ideals in Gilead in order to make their beliefs normalized and to change uh, the old beliefs. All right, let's take a look at some examples then. I think I have a total of seven examples for you. There's no need for you uh, to write these all down, but if you wanted to find them in the book as I'm going through them, that's a really good idea. And you can go ahead and mark them in the book. That's no problem. The first one is right away at in chapter one, there was old sex in the room and loneliness and expectation of something without a shape or name. I don't know how great that one is. We have the word name there. Chapter one, end of the chapter. Here's a good one. We learned to whisper almost without sound. In the semi-darkness, we could stretch out our arms when the aunts weren't looking and touch each other's hands across space. We learned to lip read, our heads flat on the beds turned sideways, watching each other's mouths. And this way we exchanged names from bed to bed. Alma, Janine, Dolores, Moira, June. And so these five women are named, they're in the red center. So they are being indoctrinated into the handmade um, occupation. I don't know if that's the right word, but role, I guess is probably better. Um, and we can, through the process of elimination, determine that Offred is, is really June uh, because we hear the other four women named later in the book, but we never will hear about June again. And because of that, then we can infer that um, Offred's real name is June. How about this one in chapter four? I know this man's name, Nick. I know this because I've heard Rita and Cora talking about him. And once I heard the commander speaking to him, Nick, I won't be needing the car. Um, here is one, this one's a little bit better, I think, um, from chapter four. This one is a little plumper than I am. Her eyes are brown. Her name is of Glenn, and that's all I know about her. She may be a real believer, a handmaid in more than name. I can't take the risk. So if something is, uh, if somebody is a handmaid in just name, that means 
they don't believe it, right? But it, she might actually believe it, and so she has to, Alfred has to be cautious about what she discloses to of Glenn. All right, how about this one from chapter five? You can see the place under the lily where the lettering was painted out when they decided that even the names of shops were too much temptation for us. Now places are known by their signs alone. So names have been eliminated in terms of lettering, you know, in, in um, so that handmaids aren't reading anything as if just the word there to be read is a temptation. And so that's an interesting um, use of this literary aspect. You can spend some time thinking about the effect of that one. Chapter five, there's another one. As I pass, she looks at, full at me into my eyes and I know who she is. She was at the Red Center with me, one of Aunt Lydia's pets. I never liked her. Her name in the time before was Janine. And so again, here is the old name. We're hearing about the name from the time before and her new name is of Warren, we learn. And here's the last one from chapter seven. Dear you, I'll say, just you without a name. Attaching a name attaches you to the world of fact, which is riskier and more hazardous. Who knows what the chances are out there of survival yours? I will say you, you, like an old love song, you can mean more than one. And so without a name, um, you know, uh, addressing the reader, um, as you without a name um, is safer for Alfred here. So that's interesting. Well, what are some of the effects of this literary aspect? Here are some ideas. You're welcome to use these or others that you think work better. First of all, naming and taking away names gives the namer power. Names have power. Uh, and in the book, they have a new kind of power because these names are being changed and determined by um, the authorities in the Gilead regime, right? And so the namer has control over how an object or a person is perceived just simply by labeling it something, giving it a name. Um, similarly, the named or unnamed is reduced in power. So the person who loses their name and gets a new name um, has less power. They didn't get to choose that name and they have less control in that way. Watch what Afra chooses to do with her original name. Um, and I mentioned to you already that we're never gonna see June referenced, um, but she is going to, to bring up her original name. So watch that and watch what she says about that um, and think about, how that choice gives Offred power in itself. Um, also, remembering old names and labels oftentimes gives Offred hope that she can return to a more humane, freer existence. You know, she can at least remember the simple names for things that no longer exist in Gilead, or at least don't exist for her. This connection to the past gives her hope, or at least an ability to continue moving forward to living. Um, another day. How about this? Accepting the new name allows Alfred to function in her current conditions. This is similar to the last one, but instead of remembering old names, it's really taking on the new name, the new label, the new role. And um, this is a kind of compartmentalizing where Alfred um, says, okay, right now I am Alfred. I am a handmaid and that's all that I am. Um, and so it kind of allows her to keep going without giving into the sorrow and the longing of the past and the former freedoms um, because she struggles with leaving behind her old name and her individuality in order to function in the current horrors. Alfred realizes that her former name is special but it has to be kept a secret in order for her to survive. She has to be Alfred in order to make it. So think about how these, oh, I've got one more, creating new words to describe things, neologisms, normalizes and gives validity to the regi regime's ideals, right? Um, the Gilead regime takes away the old names, to take away the power of the old ideas and identities, um, and some of the new words function in a way to give validity to the new ideas of the regime. Uh, so these are all some effects of this literary aspect the next thing to think about is the connection to theme 
And the first team that theme that we have is the power of voice to create truths. I think this one is sort of obvious, right? Because the namer is the person with the voice, right? And they're creating their own truths by calling a person a handmaid and changing their name from June to Afred. They are changing the truth of who that individual is. Uh, resisting oppression like a girl. How does Afred use names and the way she thinks about them to resist oppression? And how is it maybe in a way that's stereotypically feminine, um, subtle or something that she can get away with as a woman in the Gilead uh, society. Uh, innocence, guilt, and redemption. Um, what kind of guilt does Offred have and how is it connected to names? Something I didn't mention yet is the fact that she hasn't given the name of her daughter. Um, and is that connected to maybe some guilt that she has about what has happened to her daughter? Perhaps. Story and imagination as creative forces, that connects with the last example I showed you when she's imagining telling uh, a reader or a listener her story and she doesn't name them in order to keep everything safer. Um, it's a way that she has some agency, she has a creative force over her own narrative. All right, thanks for listening in and I look forward to talking to you about this literary aspect in the Hub Huddle. See if you can find something else from um, the the second reading. So uh, what is that? Pages 40, uh, 47 to 103, is it? 43 to 106 is what it is. Okay, thank you.